the class. Usually I get my friend, uh, uh, who's also a CLU MST graduate, Deb Rubright, does this, does this lecture for me. She, and uh, she had 20 plus years uh, in, the, uh, in the police force here in the county. Um, extremely knowledgeable person has dealt with this stuff, um, you know, in a, in a in a real first person way. Um, many of the cases I'll, I'll mention here, she she has some you know actual knowledge of these things. All right, so um, what are we going to talk about? Disclaimer: If anybody has any, and, and Deb usually gives this, so I'll I'll mention it. Um, if any of the cases that we're going to talk about are something that you have personal knowledge of and, you know, you know, it was your relative who was abducted and, you know, whatever, by a pedophile, you know, and this is upsetting to you, just raise your hand and I'll just stop talking about it. Okay, we don't need to go into it. And Deb does this because she's had, unfortunately, had the experience of that happening and, um, you know, some of the cases, at least one I'll mention, come from this county and so we don't want to, you know, we don't want to, um, you know, upset anybody. Okay. So this is Deb. Uh, this is her background. Again, she is a very knowledgeable person. I, I I really like her. She is a she is a cops cop. You know, her husband's a cop. She comes from a family of law enforcement. She's really a straight up person. Um, you know, she's doing her MFT licensing uh, hours now out in the community. She's working in a methadone clinic. So, you know, she's not doing all the fluffy BS stuff. She's pretty hardcore, you know, out there doing stuff. Um, you know, worked robbery, worked sexual assault investigations, worked homicide. Um, so she's a really great person. I, I hope you guys get a chance to meet her. I have been, um, um, as psychologist, you won't work with criminals from a law enforcement, you know, either way or from a perspective. You're going to have a different perspective, but you should probably understand the perspective of law enforcement, and you should probably understand how to work with law enforcement people, because that's going to be useful to you, okay, to be very, very useful to you. Also, it opens up career possibilities. Any of you want to go into forensic psychology, you know, which is a, a very interesting field, and there's a lot of work in it. Um, you know, it, you're going to need to know not only how law enforcement people um, operate, but also the district attorney's office, also the defender's office, public defenders, either private or public. Um, you should know a little bit about that world. Okay. All right. Um, and, and Deb is very respectful. You know, she has this quote, no greater honor will ever be bestowed on an officer than when he or she is entrusted with the investigation of the death of a human being. So, you know, they take this really seriously. Okay, so this is what we're going to talk about um, as far as uh, extreme criminal behaviors. Later on, I'm going to talk to you about school shooters, and we may touch a little bit on serial killers a little more. Actually, I think we're going to talk about serial killers at the end of this. So, uh, but there may be some other stuff we're going to talk about as well, but these are the ones we're going to talk, try to get to today. Um, pedophilia um, is, a, is a fetish behavior. Oh, and you know what? I have to do I have my notes on the other computer. So you guys, I don't know if you've ever uh, had a chance. Anybody here worked with pedophiles before? I've worked with people that have um, not yeah, sexual offenses. Well, there are, of course, there are levels of. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But never asked. Interest, but never acted on. At least not so much that they told you. Um, oh, yeah. Any I have to have all my notes on this computer because. I can't do both at the same time, so let me just get this set up here. Sorry for my tech things today. I'm just having tech issues today. All right, so um, pedophile. I think I mentioned to you guys that um, that I, I worked with a guy who was kind of for doing kind of long-term therapy, who was who was technically a 
a uh, pedophile, but um, did I mention that to you guys? Didn't I? He he was. Um, I just have it. It's one of those days where the computers just don't work. <laughs> it was working. It's like my life. Maybe just needs to charge for a second. So we'll, we'll get to that. So um, you know, I worked with a guy long term. I saw him in therapy for I don't know, like two years or something, on a weekly basis. And he he had been um, he had been court referred. And he had gotten in trouble by by groping his stepdaughter, who, by all accounts, had been extremely um, provocative to him. And his stepdaughter was 15 and very very well developed. I'm not excusing his behavior, but you know he, this is this is the stuff that's going on. So I mean I don't consider him to be a pedophile in the sense of being attracted to children. Per se, he was attracted to somebody who had um, mature secondary sexual characteristics. Uh, but I mean, other other aspects, he really had a lot of the the sort of things you see in a pedophile. You know, his mental age was, you know, he himself, I think, you know, emotionally, mentally, to some degree, was like 14 years old, um, and had had been abused as a child, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He had a lot of the characteristics. Yes. Yeah, it varies by state. That's a very good question. So, um, do we talk about this before? Or was that another class? Mm-hmm. It varies by state. Um, the the age of consent is is really widely variable. So, I think in Mississippi it's fourteen. So, is that what they look at them for pedophiles? Yeah. Yes. So Mississippi, in Mississippi, so there's, there's, and, and again, my understanding is, I think I have this on the slide. Um, in Mississippi, the age of consent, I believe it's Mississippi, is 14. So if 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 a person is over 14, they are thought to be able to consent to sex with, you know, basically whoever they want. In California, it's 18. So here, if you are uh, 19 years old, a male, and you have a girlfriend who's 17, and you have sex with her, and her parents decide they don't like it, they can go to the DA's office and say, this is the case of statutory rape, I want you to pro- prosecute this. And if the parents have enough pull, that actually can happen. That actually has happened here. And that guy can be sent to prison for statutory rape. Okay? Yeah. So that's happened here. Or the other way around, through right? That's happened here. On many, and, and many people think that that is just, you know, in a case where it's consensual and the people are almost the same age, they think that's just kind of ridiculous, right? But it has happened in this county especially, because this county is like the Hanging County. I mean, it has happened here. In L.A. County, they just laugh at you, right? But there are places where there are rules where if the people are certain, like one's 18, one's 17, you know, they just, there's an exemption. There are places where there are rules like that. I believe those rules have been proposed for California, but I don't believe we have those. So depending where you are in California will be depending on where things get, you know, how seriously people will take this. So it, 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 it's a little bit all over the map. And you go around the country, and if you and there's, go online and look this up, there's a map that will show you. It's a little bit all over the place. So um, it so really... It really depends where it is. Now, what we in California, we have there. Are, I believe the law works so that there's there's two classifications. The first one is a minor under the, under the age of 14, 14 or under, mm-hmm. and that's one classification. And then if somebody 14 and older, it's a different kind of thing. So maybe you know you get statutory rape or whatever, but it's not like you know considered like pedophilia. I don't know the exact terms, but there's 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 a there's a rule for that. And you can look at that when you go to Megan's law, and I'll show you Megan's law. You'll see that they'll, they'll list it, you know what what it is, and you can sort of get a sense of. They don't tell you exactly any details about the case, but you can get a sense of what's going on here. Now again, in your own mind, you might think that's just terrible for a. 20-year-old to have sex with a 16-year-old, the guy should be thrown in prison, or you might think that's no big deal. And again, if you go around the country, you will find um, we are not united in the way the different states view this. Some are 16, some are 15, some are, I think, as young as 14, maybe the youngest. 
some are 18, like California. Um, what is prosecuted and what is not prosecuted varies by county in the state of California. It varies by DA, which DA have time or want to pay attention to it, which don't think it's worthwhile. Certainly, if it's under the age of consent, if it's under the age, especially in California, 14, it's, it's considered to be serious. Okay. So, California Penal Code, here we go. Uh, here's, here's, what, here's the thing that people get. Um, lewd, lascivious acts under the age of 14, continuous sexual abuse of a child, and, of course, sex offender registrant. These guys have to register now in the state of California. Okay. That's, that's important. Is the thing working yet? I can show you the notes. Have you ever heard of a test that you want to use that for these people with their... Um, yeah. <laughs> they do what? I don't know much, but I had. He had to go through that. He was describing it in detail. Which test? Oh, the penile plasmograph. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, you guys should know all about that that handy piece of equipment. I had a friend of mine who's a psychologist, one of my best friends, and he, um, you know, as many new starting out psychologists do, he, uh, he, um, you know, basically took whatever job he could get and. The job he could get was working in a sex offender clinic where they um, use such devices. So I actually know a little bit about it. Um, you guys know what a penile plasmograph is? No. It's a device that attaches to the penis, and then if, if, it, if, if, if the penis starts to move and show arousal, it will register. And then um, there's another one for women too that uses a photo cell. Yeah, show them, show them pictures of little kids, and then if they start to get a little rise, then it, but it registers. Non um, yeah, it could be oh, it could be either. It could well, be no, sexual. Because oh, because they were showing the sexual ones. Yeah, because yeah. that's a little controversial, yeah. right? That's a little controversial. So that that um, again, you know, that's a little controversial, uh, but. They use these things for research, and so my friend worked in a clinic where they would actually use um, uh, punishment. They would guy would they would show the guy pictures, and I believe these ones had sexual content, and he would get a rise, Dr. Vinkman like they would zap the guy, and this, this is a treatment for. Would they zap him down there? No, no, they wouldn't zap him. <laughs> they just zap him. Yeah, and there's there's a lot of you know, I mean they're trying to do research on this stuff. So I mean that's that's the uh, you know, they want to understand this. But again, you know, this is the behavioral paradigm. So if you treat sex offender sex offenders, you know, from a behavioral standpoint, this is the kind of thing that you use. Um, my friend and I, he, he, he's a smart guy, um, you know, we, we, we've had some arguments about this. He claims that, you know, it actually is useful and does something. I claim that the research shows that it's not very useful, doesn't do much. So, you know, we've gone back and forth about these things. You know, you can look it up yourself and, and figure it out. I mean, in general, there is not really, in my opinion, there's not really good treatments for pedophilia. No, let's put this other way. There are good treatments for pedophilia, um, but, you know, you know, um, you know, in this country, we're just not stringing them up, right? Um, castration, actually, depending on the type of castration, may or may not be a good treatment. Okay? It's, it, it, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but, yeah, it actually is not necessarily a good treatment. So these are the these are the codes. So um, this is the case. This is the case that Deb talks about. That was um, was relatively local. This was a young girl. I think she was two. She was um, basically being watched by her grandmother or something out in the front yard of her house in Camarillo, and was in 1978 and was um, abducted. And her mom was 20 years old, was at work, and she was being watched by the grandmother. Grandmother goes upstairs to do chores. And the girl's asleep on the couch watching cartoons. So this is a typical thing, you know, kids sleeping on the couch, you go upstairs to do some chores, you don't think anything of it, right? Grandmother comes back downstairs, no notices that the kid's no longer on the couch, looks around for it, doesn't see anything, goes outside, starts looking around, starts yelling her name, can't find her anywhere, freaks out, and calls the police. Um, and the little girl uh, was missing for 48 hours, 
and a, a, a homeowner in the neighborhood um, looked out their front window and saw his dogs playing with something bloody on the driveway. Called the dogs back in, locked them inside, went to the driveway, and saw that it was a the body of a little girl, a bloody body of a little girl. Um, they used palm prints, and they identified the body as this little girl, Amy Sue Sykes. And they did a, uh, um, the medical examiner was called in, and they did a forensic analysis. They found she was forced to drink alcohol. They, she had been raped to the extent that her vaginal and anal cavity uh, were, were connected. She had been punched in the face with full force. She had suffered massive brain hemorrhaging. She had skull fractures, and her nipples had been pulled from her body with vice grips while she was still alive. And she had leaves and dirt shoved up her vaginal cavity. So this was an extremely brutal, brutal crime to this little two-year-old girl. Did they? What? Did they find her? Yes, they found her. She was in the driveway. No, him. Yes. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to that, yes. Um, extensive search. Uh, there had been eyewitness. There had been some witnesses um, who had been in the neighborhood. Um, and they had a guy. They were, there was a person of interest that they had know, knew about. And they, his name was Theodore Frank. And he had been arrested previously uh, in, in the case of molestation of an eight-year-old girl. And he'd been... But he had spent 14 years locked up in hospitals and prison in both Missouri and California. He had been released six weeks before from a Tascadero State Prison where he'd done time for raping a four-year-old. Okay. So again, uh, lots of recidivism. These guys, these pedophiles, um, you know, they do it once, they're likely to do it again. And again, this is why people say when we put a pedophile away, we shouldn't let him out again. Okay. And again, if you want a law enforcement perspective, they're going to tell you this is the kind, this is the thing they see when they see these cases that these guys get out and they do it again. And remember, we saw Stephen Stainer. The guy was 70 years old and he was trying to get his nurse, he's invalid, you know, in a you know nursing home, trying to get his nurse to get a little boy. <coughs> so this is the argument for putting these, especially these hardcore pedophiles, putting them away, and keeping them out of sight. Okay. Um, so this guy was uh, arrested. And um, he's also for arrested for two other molestations in the San Fernando Valley. He was convicted in those two cases. He had several more offenses, um, as I mentioned, um, including he raped a small boy, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which is also unusual because usually these pedophiles, they, they, they have a preference for one sex or the other. Usually they like boys or like girls. In most cases, I believe it's actually girls. Girls get, get, uh, are subject to more molestation than boys. But in this case, he liked he, he would you know, it was equal opportunity, or at least he would do uh, you know have sex with boys on occasion. Okay. Um, he was in the task there. He wrote in his notebook, and he wrote in his own notebook, "Why do I want to degrade and humiliate children? Sadism. I enjoy the humiliation. Defile the innocent. Make them scared of sex. It's dirty. I didn't have a happy childhood. Neither will they. Revenge. So that was in his notebook. He wrote in while he was in Tascadero. He was." Uh, he was, uh, he was prosecuted in the Sykes case, and he was sentenced to death. Um, and uh, they had an appeal. It was upheld. But the death penalty had been overturned in California by that time, so he was commuted to life imprisonment. Seven years after the murder, they had another uh, sentence, um, and he was sentenced to death. But again, um, never made it to death row. Uh, he had suffered from heart disease, and the state paid for him to have open heart surgery, many thousands of dollars. And again, there's your law enforcement perspective. Um, he w was a fairly good painter, and he was allowed to sell his artwork uh, to, to, to make money, which I'm not sure is allowed now. I think they don't allow that anymore. Um, unlike today, the victim's family didn't make anything. He didn't get paid no restitution to the victims of the family. 23 years after Amy, Amy had been murdered and tortured, um, the, the murderer suffered a heart attack and died at the age of 63 while in prison. So you can take from what that what you will. How old was he? He was, well, whatever. He was uh, 30. Yeah. yeah, so so that was a local case. So again, you know, this is um, this kind of stuff happens even in a place in Camarillo is considered to be a very safe city, you know. I mean, we, our county is considered to be very safe. Oxnard just made the list of one of the safest cities in the country. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know about that? You know about that? No? No? I mean, no, I think it was the name for weather. No. Made it in the, in the safest city, one of the safest cities. What the hell are you talking about? 
so again, again, you know, I mean, there's a few neighborhoods in Oxnard that, that have some problems. We're going to talk about that in a minute. We'll talk about gangs in a minute. Um, but yeah, Oxnard made a mistake. Lots of parts of Oxnard are very sick. So. Yeah, actually, we have shootings in Newberry Park in San Diego. Do we have them there? Four a week. Well, I'll let you guys discuss about that amongst yourselves. So that's Amy Suicide. So what do we know about pedophilia? 60% of convicted sex offenders are on probation or parole. So 60% of the guys who've been convicted of this have done it before. Okay. Well, that's, that's a good question. Your state's going broke from uh, having people in prison. So we could have a little, we could have a political discussion here, and we could say, why are you putting people in prison for, you know, for marijuana expenses, but you're letting sex offenders out to have this discussion? And again, I don't think I would have to take a law enforcement. I think if we had law enforcement people here in the room. My guess is they would go, yeah, we would agree. You know, why are we have spending our time like getting people like, smoking pot or selling pot when you know sex offenders are being let out? So again. You know there there are reasons around this. I'm sure some of you could tell us, but this is a the case here. You know whether or not people are using the knowledge that psychologists and law enforcement people have developed about this, you know, disorder. If you want to look at it as a psychological disorder, the fact that recidivism rate is very high, people know that. So again, this is a question you can ask yourself. Rate of recidivism very high among sex offenders. Two thirds of sex offenders in prison were victimized as child. So we know these people were tended to be abused as children and when they grow up they tend to become abusers. So, you know, again, where do you break the cycle of violence? You know, you know, again, anybody can become a parent. So the worst person in the world, you know, the worst abusive, sadistic, you know, worst person in the world, all they have to do is have sex, unprotected sex, and they can become a parent. And, you know, Parenting is, you know, so if you want to learn the root of the problem, is it's, it's in poor parenting, abusive parenting, being an uh, abuser. Most of these guys have have, uh, have been have been abused, or at least report being abused. Probably more. My guess is that more of them, you know, but they just haven't said or they haven't, you know, caught to it. Ninety percent of victims know they're offenders. So this is a very interesting thing. Stranger um, pedophilia is actually relatively rare. Most pedophilia, most uh, uh, of this kind of abuse, occurs with somebody who is known to the family, either a relative or somebody who's close to the family. Okay? Very, very important. So, you know, when you go and leave your kids in Uncle Joe's because, oh, well, you know, we know Uncle Joe, he's a good guy. He, <coughs> likes, he, likes, he just likes kids. You know, a little paranoia goes a long way. Right? So one thing is, one suggestion is that you be even people you know, you think you know, who you're close to in your family, you really scrutinize them when they're when they're taking care of your kids. If you're thinking of having to take care of your kids. Median age for sexual assault of victims is thirteen, which I guess you could look at that as the glass being half empty or half full. Um, you know, I mean half full, well at least by thirteen maybe they you know, they're starting to let look less like kids. You know, so maybe there's hope for people who victimize people this young. Eh, same time, 13-year-olds, you know, you know, relatively easily manipulated. So, class half empty. Um, but that's the median age. I believe so. Yeah, I believe so. Um, do I have a? Now, what Deb has told me is that in her in her experience working. In law enforcement, that she believes the median age is more like nine. Yeah. And so part of this may be may be having to do with how you know how uh, pedophilia is being defined, right? So in California, you may define somebody older as suffering from pedophilia, so it pushes the median up. But if you're out in the field and you're seeing what comes in, what Deb is telling me is that it's more around nine. Okay. Which, in some way, I agree, makes makes more sense. Okay. Children often to fail to report uh, abuse because they feel disclosure will bring consequences even worse, worse than being victimized again. Victim may fear consequences for the family, feel guilty uh, for consequences to the suspect, may feel uh, fear subsequent retaliation from the suspect, 
It's often told the mother and father will think it's their fault, and so the feelings of guilt may keep them from wanting to report, and we know certainly in the past that this stuff has been underreported. That may still be the case. Of course, that's just brought up that that's a media name. That's yeah. Not yeah, media. That means that that 13 is at the middle point, but younger. Right, right. Okay, 21% of those who committed sexual assault were on probation or parole for previous sexual assault. 79% of children initially denied any sexual abuse, and then later the claims were founded. So again, this is not something that kids want to easily just cop to. It's just difficult. Maybe traumatic entrapment syndrome, it may be you know, something else going on, but it, it, this is not easy. Okay? Young victims may not know what is going on with them as sexual abuse. They may not realize it. You know, they don't know anything better. Right? Especially kids who are, you know, they, they, they're not you know, they're young enough to be, you know, not fully verbal yet. And again, this is maybe why some predators like children of extremely young age, because they can't really articulate well. Victimization rates decline as age increases. Yeah, as they become more like adults than, you know. But again, it may be the categorization has something to do with this. You know, you don't... Categorize them as pedophilia, categorize them as statutory rape or something else. So it may be good. Okay. Also, but, it, but another way it makes sense is the older the kid gets, they know what's going on, right? Uh, divorce cases, um, we do know that um, a rate of abuse by gender, two females per hundred, one male per hundred. So l roughly twice as many females are abused as males. Divorce cases and claims of sexual abuse, um, and again, there was a 12-state study. They looked at 9,000 divorce cases and child abuse allegations were made in less than 2% of contested divorces involving child custody. So this isn't commonly something that the spouse will say is going on to try to get custody of the kids or prevent the other, the other spouse from getting custody. It's not a common thing. This is something you commonly hear. Oh, they just claim child abuse because they want to get custody or they want to get more alimony or whatever. It's not common. So, as you guys may have seen lately in the media, Dylan Farrow, right, Mia Farrow's daughter, came out and said, you know, she's now an adult, and she said, yeah, I, you know, Woody Allen's up for some award, I just want to let you know, you know, in case you forgot, he is a child molester, and he molested me from this time period to this time period on a regular basis. And people come back and said, well, you know, she was just planning her head by her mom, was going through a custody battle. Not likely. What in the world, what, what would, and I'm a little biased about here, about this, so I'll cop to that. Uh, Mia Farrow is a distant cousin. Mia Farrow's mom and my grandmother were cousins. So that makes her a second, I don't know, some distant cousin. I'm a little biased. I don't know her, but I'm a little biased. Um, you know, why would Dylan Farrow come out with this? you know, bring this to light again, and, you know, well, I would, you expect if she just wanted to get over, she'd just go on with her life, right? Why would she bring this out? You know, so I believe her. You know, I, in my mind, I have no doubt that Woody Allen is a child molester. You know, and, like his yes, that yes, like, yes. So again, that, that also, that also, is, and, and, and also, you know, her, Dylan Barrett's case was brought up to the, some DA in Connecticut who, thought there was really probable cause, but it was never prosecuted. And you got to wonder, when this happens when somebody's very powerful and famous, you know, things get squelched. And, and you know, I think she's uh, very brave for bringing it up now. And uh, you know, Woody Allen is a powerful, important guy, so he has lots of people willing to defend him. And, you know, and so, but again, you know, to say that, well, it's because of the divorce of Woody and Mia, I'm not buying it. And again, the research shows that that's not typical. Okay? All right, proving sexual abuse. How do you prove this when some kid comes in, you know, and you know, makes an allegation of this, and if you work for Child Protective Services, this will be your bread and butter? Again, I think if I were running the clinical psychology world, I might make everybody do a, a stint with Child Protective Services. I think that would be a good thing to do for six months, you know, before you go out and practice with, you know, neurotic people in Westlake. You know, you should have to do a stint with Child Protective Services. So how do you prove this? Well, Bruises, burns, broken bones, things like this, physical abuse, are much more easily identifiable than, than um, child sexual abuse. Sexual abuse is harder, and it usually has to be proven without corroboration or physical evidence. Okay.
Okay, and this is this is this is what the DA has to look for. You've got to get somebody to say, Yeah, I saw this happen or I knew this was going on. Or you have to get, you know, physical evidence, you know, relatively soon after the the you know you know the abuse occurs. Okay, so it's difficult. It's not an easy thing to do. And again, this is probably why there isn't more prosecution of this stuff. Okay. So when Dylan Farrow makes a you know a a allegation and the DA thinks, yeah, you know, this probably really happened, but I'm not going to prosecute it. It may not just be because Woody Allen's a famous and powerful person. Maybe he doesn't have enough physical evidence that he feels like he can really successfully bring it to court, especially against a you know a, a powerful, influential person. Okay. Um, now, there's been some epidemiological um, evidence here. So who are the, who are, who are the least likely uh, group of people to be abusers and victims? Well, interestingly enough, it's um, uh, our Native Americans. For whatever reason, the Native Americans um, are, are, are least likely to be uh, abusers. And if it's a Native American victim, they are likely to be abused by a non-Native American, by somebody of a different race. So very interesting. So, you know, I don't know if there's a reason for that, but whatever reason, that's Native Americans. So if you want to have, if you want to, if you're paranoid and, you know, have somebody watching your kid, you know, if they're, you know, Native American, that's not not a 100% foolproof thing, but that's, you know, at least, at least likely. And maybe it's because, you know, there is, you could guess about this, and, and again, this would be an interesting area to do some research on. Maybe it's because you know sexual abuse of kids is rare in Native American communities. I don't know. Maybe it's because there's an extended family. You could you could think of um, is lots. Is that of, more than Is that what? No, I mean it may be an extended family that that is you know that where you know they're extended in a in a in a positive way where people you know keep check on each other and. You can't do anything without something happening. I don't know. I'm just speculating about this. Um, now, the most likely person to commit child sexual abuse, pedophilia, is a white male. Okay, and I think most of us, you know, have heard this before. This is the typical. Okay, we're going to see that white males are also respond, you know, most likely for some other crimes as well. But this is one that they're most likely uh, suspects for. Suspect age can vary. Uh, you can have uh, different ages here. Um, jail sentences de vary depending on the type of crime and where it was committed and all this kind of stuff, what the DA thinks they can get um, a conviction for. There are female molesters. You guys may have heard of some of these. Um, uh, typically, the ones that have been in the news have been, um, you know, teachers who fall in love with these, you know, 14, 15-year-old boys and they get... Um, uh, you know, caught, and then they get in trouble and thrown in prison. And you got to ask yourself here, you know, and I'll be honest, we're, we're, you know, I mean, I'm not taking a side here, but, you know, people have said, well, is it the same? Is it the same if you're a 15-year-old boy and your teacher starts a romantic relationship with you? Is that the same as being a, a you know, a 13-year-old, 14-year-old, 15-year-old girl and, you know, having an older man, um, you know, you know, coerce you into into sex. You know, and, and and I would say, in my opinion, I think that in our society, there's probably a sense among a lot of people that there's a double standard. That people don't think, you know, it's just bad for the boy. You know, like, oh, woo-hoo, you know, like, he's got something to brag to his friends about, you know. And again, this would be a very interesting area to study, you know, to look at these boys who've been, who've had these relationships with their teachers and look at girls who've had similar relationships with an older person and see, you know, you know, afterwards, you know, is there a trauma? Are the boys traumatized as the female? You know, now the law treats them the same, which most people would probably think is a good thing. You know, so these teachers have been thrown in jail and they can't ever teach again. But in some of these cases, I know there was one case, um, you know, where the teacher, you know, was thrown in jail and the young man, in this case, I think he was 13 when they started their relationship, um, he waited for her, and when she got out of prison, he was like 19 or something, and they 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 restarted their relationship again. You know, and I think maybe may, I think they I think they had kids. Yeah, so great. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I think, again, you know, for those of coming up the second and third years looking for a dissertation topic, fascinating dissertation topic here. Really interesting to see. Is there, is there, because I think we do have this sense of a double standard in a lot of the mind of the public. Is this a real double standard or not? Are the boys traumatized by this? You know, certainly we know girls are traumatized by this to some degree, but has anybody actually gone out and studied this and measured it? Fascinating thing to look at. So, again, if you... Yes. Well, no, there are. I mean, you know, if anybody's seen, uh, you know, Red Nabokov's Lolita, you know, I mean... Yeah, I, I'm going to agree with you. I'm, I'm going to, without, without, without knowing, I'm going to say my perception is that I would agree with you. But, um, again, I mean, I think this is, this is worth looking at. You know, I mean, this would be a very interesting thing to study, you know. Now, what Deb has told me as far as female molesters is that her, in her entire experience, um, she never ran across a female molester. Never? Never. So, again, the female molesters are relatively rare. Okay. And I don't have a number for you. But they are, it is, it is very unlikely that a pedophile is going to be female. It can occur. It can happen. They are very, very rare. And I think the ones you see, you know, like the teachers and stuff, they're dealing with kids who are teenagers. You know, they're at an older age. So, again, you know, if you want to, you know, again, the law would not call that the same. You know, they'd make a distinction over 14, under 14 in California. Well, if they find it's not that rare, it's just not as reported. It could be not as reported, and that could have something to do with the double standard. Again, something worthy of a doctoral dissertation to study this. Uh, you know it's quite what I've here also on the last couple of slides is how many of these pedophiles were molested themselves? Many. No, I think didn't I have that? Yeah. 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 Two thirds reported. Two thirds reported, and my guess is it's more than that. I would guess it's more than that. So yeah, very very common. Yes, I guess I'm going to So, yes. How about the degrees of these sexual abuse and that has indicated why women have done with them in the Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, that may be, that also may be, we'll get to that in a second, so remind me of that. Um, can you have a normal sexual relationship and also be a pedophile? Can you be married yes. and be a pedophile? A yeah, very oh. common. A lot of times these guys um, are, you know, they're married, they, they, their wife will say, he had sex with me, well, I don't know why, you know. Yeah, yeah that, 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 that does occur. Again, I don't have a prevalence rate for you, but that, that is no new, you know, in many cases. These guys, you know, they, they may have, a, and sometimes, you know, you know, like it's sort of the Lolita thing, you know, they'll marry a woman maybe to get access to the kids, right? And you've all heard cases about step parents, you know, and this is another relatively common thing. You know, step parents don't have a good, Track record, especially male characters, have a good track record anyway. Okay, so yes, you can have normal, be in a normal sexual relationship, and still be a pedophile. Have want to have sex with kids. Now, pedophiles you've known and loved, um, or no, I'm, just, I'm no joking. What are the characteristics of pedophiles? Well, um, I don't know if we know and love all these people. We know. I don't know. I don't know well, yeah, I would. I I, I admit that in quotations. Um, uh, so, you know, again, I don't know that anybody's ever proved that Michael Jackson was a pedophile. Certainly he had, he had... Yeah, people have come out and said that. The one, the one case is, you know, was a little suspect. Other ones, I think, less so. Um, I would say highly suspect because we do know that, that Michael... He, he, he suffered some abuse as kids. And, and the other thing about him is very interesting. We're going to get to body modification. We're going to talk about people who get a little addicted to body modification. Body, this body dysmorphic. What is it? Integrative body integrity disorder? Is that the new one? Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that. I think he, I think he was suffering from that. I think, you know. And, uh, you know. But some people say, you know, that he was, some kids who, who he hung out with said he treated them really well and he was really nice and didn't abuse them. So, I have a little question mark about Michael Jackson, but I don't know. Woody Allen, I think, is a total pedophile. Um, there, here's some other ones. These are the teachers. I think these two were the teachers. This guy, I'm trying to remember his name. Um, uh, he is like your standard 
Yeah. And this guy too, he represented himself. So, yes. Would you consider Roman Polanski to be a pedophile? I, I, yeah, Roman Polanski, is this Roman Polanski? No. Maybe that's him. Roman Polanski, um, so again, you know, we have this, this question, and, and I, I don't have a good answer for this. You know, technically, in the state of California, Roman Polanski is a pedophile. And you guys all know that he fled the country. He's a very famous film director. He fled the country, and the reason he fled the country was because he was carrying on what he termed a love affair with a 13-year-old girl. And he, 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 he claimed it was a consensual affair that he had with her, um, and he wasn't trying to hide it, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the parents or somebody got wind of it, and they, no way, you know, and they had him prosecuted, and he was convicted. And so he, he, or he left, and he was convicted in absentia. If you leave, not good for your case, right? But she, she has come out and said that I believe that he should not be convicted of this. No, he said he should. Oh, she said he should? Okay, I got that wrong. Three months ago, it was in the LA Times, and he said that he took her to a house a friend, and he It was coercive, yeah, it was coercive. Okay, so I got that wrong. That's right. Now I remember that. Yeah, yeah. I thought she said that they shouldn't bother. They they shouldn't bother at the end. Of, okay. Okay. Good. I'm glad you said that because I I had that wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So that's good. I had that wrong. So that's that's I'm glad you corrected me on that. So yeah, I mean, in the state of California, he is considered to be a pedophile. He is, you know, you know, and and they've been trying to get that dropped, and you know. So yeah, but again, you know, is is it treated differently because you know the victim is a teenager? Now she was like 13, right? I think I think she was 15. I thought she said. So 15 would be treated differently than than 13 in California. 13. 13. Yeah, I think it was that. That's what I remember. Yeah, that's what I remember was 13. So so yeah, he would be considered to be a, a pedophile, you know. Um, well, there you go. Yeah, I mean, you know, again, what happens when the person is, you know, if you got a poor, poor person, you know, you know, in in a poor, poor place, and they get pulled over by the police and they get caught with this, <laughs> they're going to jail if you're Roman Polanski or Woody Allen. I mean, this is the inequity in our system, you know. I mean. Roman Polanski can go live in his chateau in Switzerland and mm-hmm. avoid extradition, or at least try to avoid it, because he has tons of money. And you know, yeah, I mean, it's unfortunately there's a lot of injustice here. You know. Well, that's a really interesting case. Will you hold off on that? Because I have a whole lecture we're going to talk about her, because she had a relationship with her father, but it was after she was an adult. We're going to talk about that. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. No, no, they were they were separated. No, no, they did drugs, but they were they were separated until a much later age. So we're going to talk about that. So save that. Save that till later. Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, uh, situation. Uh, some cases they'll give the drugs to the kid, try to you know either either to you know lure the kid into the van or to get the kid more pliable or whatever it is that they, they want to do. So sometimes they use that way. They'll also use the drugs as an excuse. Went through that class. Well, I, you know, I'm not interested in kids, but, you know, I, I smoked some PCP and suddenly I didn't know what I was doing. Right. So that's also very common. It commonly uses an excuse. Okay. Um, okay. Do you think uh, sex offenders... Um, Pedophiles think they feel guilty? No. 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 Yeah, well, that's, that's a good question. What about rapists? No. Maybe. Sometimes. Maybe, yeah. Sometimes. Depends on the type. Yeah. Um, at what age do you think abusers begin um, abusing ch- children? Really young. Like before the teen years, some of them. I don't know about both. No, it's different. It's different. I would say, my understanding is I think it's in adolescence. I mean, I think they've got to start going through puberty. But, you know, I mean, abusing, sexually abusing, right? I have a question about that. Yeah. Why, maybe this is just, I forget what it's called, but um, why do you see more like what we getting caught for? 
Well, I don't know that that's the case. Um, when you see a middle-aged guy getting caught for it, you have to suspect that he's been caught for it before. Okay. Okay, because I didn't have a slide last time. You know, it's like there's, there's a high recidivism rate. And these guys, you know, especially the, the ones that are targeting, you know, the younger kids, you know, they, 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 they've been doing it for a while. Okay. Um, it may be, you know, there may be some um, distinction there because if somebody is 19 and they are targeting a 13-year-old, maybe he doesn't get prosecuted as much, depending on where you're at, you know, part of the state you're at, depending on the, you know, the laws of consent. But by the time that guy is 25 or 30, then now people are going, ah. And in some states, I believe there's a 10-year um, difference rule. Like if you're, you know, if for instance, the girl is 16 and the guy is, you know, 20, they won't really bother with it. But if he's 30, then, you know, that's that's something that they'll go after. You know, either either a, um, something written in the statute, and I know there's some places where that's written in the statute, or it's, it's just what the DA, you know, what their criteria are for prosecuting the case. Especially if they're too busy and they don't have time to, you know, go after every single thing, right? Um, okay. Uh, how does sexual abuse begin? You guys pretty much know this. We talked about this before. Flirting. The guy, the sexual abusers will flirt with the kid. And they'll think that the kid is responding to the flirt. You know, and they'll be, they'll say things like when Deb would, would take these guys in, you know, they'd rest them and take them into the question room and she'd say, well, you know what went on? And, and the guy would go, well, you know, she was asking for it. What do you mean? Well, she was dancing around all provocative in front of me. And this is a pedophile talking about, like, for instance, a five-year-old girl. Right? I mean, it's kind of ridiculous. But in their minds, and so what they would do is they would flirt, they would be friendly, they would, you know, kind of make friends, and, and then they would take what the kid is doing as sort of being provocative toward them. Right? And this is why, by the way, Deb Rubright tells me that a lot of times she would be very successful as a female police officer interrogating these guys because the male police officers are just, just take these guys and they just want to kill them. They want to beat the crap out of them and, and they won't engage and they won't really have a talk. And she would actually like be able to put aside her feelings and be able to talk to these guys and try to get them to open up a little bit. And this is the kind of stuff they would say. And of course it's very incriminating as well, right? You know, when you say a five-year-old, you know, was enticing me, you know, let's, let's put that before the jury and see what they think, you know. And so she was able to get the stuff that she had a very high conviction rate of these guys because she was able to get them to, to sort of open up and then, you know, inevitably they'd spill something, they'd say something and uh, that would get them uh, prosecuted. Um, the other thing is that uh, penetration uh, does not occur as frequently as other forms of, of, of sexual abuse. So it's not just these these poor children are, are, are being penetrated. You know, there's other forms of abuse as well. And, and, and the penetration is not as frequent as the other forms. Okay. Yes? What's the difference between abuse and molestation? I'm using them. I'm using them. Um, yeah, interchange. Yeah. I mean, abuse, we could talk about, I mean, in the context of this slide, I mean sexual abuse. But, you know, we could say physical abuse. Not in terms of Yeah, I think it's molestation, abuse, yeah. I mean, penetration may not be as frequent, but when you caught it, that's the most of these forms. Like, even yeah, and it does occur, it does occur, and of course, you know, I mean, to get down to the nitty gritty of it, if, you know, a child is penetrated and the perpetrator ejaculates, he's leaving behind DNA evidence. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes, you know, my guess would be that, you know, the more, the, you know, the, the worst violation, mm -hmm. um, is, is what gets prosecuted because you know, it's possible to, to get some evidence for that. Yeah. Right? It's where the other types, much harder to get evidence, right? Much harder to get evidence. And what you really need to do is you have corroborating witnesses or the person has to be caught in the act or the person has to admit to it. And so it's much harder to, um, to, to prosecute. Mm -hmm. That'd be my guess. All right, um, you guys know about Megan's Law. Um, you know, Megan was a little girl who was abducted by a guy who had got out on parole, and unfortunately she was not the only one to have this happen to her. And so enough people got pissed off and, you know, got the 
legislature to pass a law because what happened in, in, in the case of, of Megan was that uh, a, a convicted child molester was out on parole and moved in across the street and the family had no idea that, you know, across the street there's a convicted child molester and we all know they have high recidivism rates and, you know, if you know one's living across the street, you guard your kids really carefully. Well, they didn't know and she was, you know, uh, raped and murdered and um, the parents and other people lobbied to pass this law, which is now in effect. And it's an odd law because on the face of it, it's it's great. You know, you can go on the government website here and you pull this up. And um, and now, by the way, many, many other states have this now too. And if you go to this website or you go to the sheriff's website, there's a link to the, to the uh, national map. And you can go click by state and do this. But you go on the California one and you can click on your neighborhood or wherever you're at and you can see where all the the pedophiles live. And a few years ago when I first gave this lecture, or when Deb first gave it, um, I hadn't heard of this. You know, I thought, oh, I'll go on. And I went on and, holy shit, you know, my guy who moved in just across the street from me. Yeah. And, but the odd law is odd because you can't use the information in the law. Like I, you know, like, I wanted to go to my neighbors and say, hey, by the way, you know, a convicted pedophile has moved in across the street. I don't like that. I bet you don't like it too. Let's try to get this guy kicked out of the house or, you know, make a move. You can't do that legally. In other words, there's also this protection of the rights of these individuals. Um, and it, I sound a little biased about that. I, I, I will admit to some bias about that. I think when you're convicted of a you know, of molesting a child that maybe you lose some of your rights permanently. I don't know, but you guys may have a different opinion about that. But you can't go. And, and so what I could do legally is go to my neighbors and go, Why, hey, have you heard about this Megan's Law website? It's pretty interesting. You might want to go look at it, right, which is, which, is, which, is, which is actually what happened. And then what you can't do is go... And then when the neighbors find out about it, okay, oh, you found out about it too, right? You can't tell them about it. You can't tell them the guy's a child molester. The owner of the house is not allowed to um, evict the person from the house because they're a convicted child molester, right? And we had to go to the owner of the house and say, hey, by the way, have you looked at Megan's law rate lately? <laughs> Might be interesting to check the neighborhood out, you know, just take a look and then find out that the guy you rented the house to is a convicted child molester. So what is ironic to me, and again, you know, we've got lots of things like this in our society, but what's ironic to me is, you know, the neighbors got together, they talked to the owner of the house, and eventually the guy was evicted from the house. How do you think we evicted him from the house? How, what, what, why was he evicted? We couldn't evict him for being a child molester, you know, raping a kid. Not allowed to evict him from the house. Then. What did we evict him of? No, because he smoked in the house. And the house in his lease was a non-smoking clause. You're not allowed to smoke in the house. He smoked in the house. We got him kicked out of the house, evicted for smoking in the house. Okay. Not for raping a kid. So, so he moves somewhere else where people don't know that he's a well, anywhere he goes in California, they're going to know if he registers, which some don't do, don't do. But yeah, I mean, anywhere he goes, they all know he's a child molester. And my guess is if he moves around in a neighborhood where there's lots of kids um, and the parents are, um, you know, cognizant of this, they may, but they may or may not be able to kick him out, you know. Now, there are some states, I think it's Georgia or something, where they, you know, they have this, and there are rules in California about how close these convicted pedophiles can live near a school. Um, but there are states that have really incredibly restrictive laws about where these guys can live, and I think it's Georgia or somewhere where there's a, a bridge out in the middle of nowhere, and it's like the only place in the county or the state where the child molesters can live, so they all live under the bridge. You know, would, you know, which to me seems reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, other people would say, oh, no, you know, they got to live somewhere, and where are you going to put them? And, you know, I mean, I have some ideas about that. I, I hear Detroit's looking for people to live there, you know. Um, actually, that's probably really mean to the people of Detroit. So, 
you know. Uh, so you know, it, it, it's a societal problem. And, and when you go on the Megan's Law website, you're going to be quite surprised to see how many um, uh, you know people are out there. Now, Deb gave a statistic that's very interesting, and I gave you I gave you one statistic about the 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 the, the, uh, the racial profile people who are least likely to be molesters. Remember that. Native Americans, right? Who do you think are the most likely to be? Who are reported most likely to be? Creepy men? Creepy white men? Um, most, of the, most of the guys are, are white men, but what I, another statistic that Deb gave out was that there are more molestation cases among Latino men. And I don't know how, I didn't get any, she didn't give me any piece of research to back that up, but what I have heard is that in some cases, you know, I, I'm not a big believer that any of this stuff has to do with people's race, you know, because somebody looks different or whatever. But I think culturally, especially people coming to the country who are very poor, they come in, they take very, you know, poor paying jobs. What happens to families? You guys know families of farm workers, migrant farm workers. You're probably seeing some of them in your practice. What's the typical family situation? How many people are living in the house? Yeah. yeah. And so it may be that when people are crammed together, you get more cases of, you know, this kind of thing happening. Um, I, my guess is that that, that is nothing to do with a person being Latino or not. My guess is that it might have to do with whatever um, situation people are in. So I've heard that. Anyway, I don't know. Um, I, I'd actually, if one of you guys wants to look that up and verify that, I'd be interested. Because I'm not sure that Deb, she pulled that out. I'm like, I had heard that before. Sex offender registration, um, you know, these guys, once they become sex offender, and this could be any kind of sex offender. So there is a distinction between the pedophiles who get that original thing, lewd and lascivious acts with a minor under 14, and, and, and then sex offenders with minors who are over the age of 14, which in California, my understanding is, um, is they're, they're, they're treated, you know, it's a statutory rape. Right, so you're a, you know, an 18 year old, and you have a 15 year old girlfriend, and you know you're prosecuted for that. You're not prosecuted as a pedophile. You're prosecuted as somebody committing statutory rape, which is different. Okay? And if you're on the Megan's Law website, it'll tell you what the person had. So if you see somebody who had whatever the thing is for statutory rape, you know that's not the same. And I would say generally not the same psychologically as somebody who is, you know, convicted for lewd and lascivious acts of a minor under 14. Okay. And we didn't talk too much about statutory rape laws in California, right? Every, the problem with these laws is that every state has a different age of consent. Well, a lot of them have different ages of consent, and they vary really quite wildly. I think in Mississippi or Alabama somewhere, the age of consent is 14. In California, it is 18. But the law is you get prosecuted for pedophilia if it's 14 or under. So there's this age of 14 to 18 where, you know, basically, um, you know, having sex with a minor in that age range, you know, gets you prosecuted under these sort of rape laws. Now, the problem is, say you're 18 and your girlfriend is 17, um, technically you're committing a crime. Technically you're committing statutory rape in California. Now... Some counties, like L.A. County, for instance, who are overworked and overbooked, are they going to go after somebody, you know, 18-year-old or 19-year-old who, you know, has a 17-year-old girlfriend? Think they're going to go after them? No. They don't have time. They're dealing with all sorts of other stuff. Ventura County, not likely, but it has happened in this county. And what happens is the parent will get upset. You know, hey, my girlfriend's out with this guy. I don't like him you know, or he's a different race, or he's something, something about him I don't like. And if the parent has influence, they go to the DA's office to make a stink, and the DA will open a case. And, and that has happened in this county. It, it, it's not like the cops in this county have a lot of time to be dealing with stuff like that either, but it has happened here. Because, again, this is the hanging county, right? You guys know that, right? You know, you know it's, it, 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 it's the saying, it's like, you know, you... You commit commit crime in, in Ventura County and you know you're you're in jail. Right. 
which is why they wanted to stick that prison over here, because we're putting so many people in the prisons, they figured you should buy housing in your county. Right. Of course, they tried to put it next to the rich people, so you know, it didn't go anywhere. But that, that's, that's the deal. So this is kind of the hanging county for this kind of stuff. Okay, uh, sex offenders have to, uh, they have to register, and I believe it's once they register, they pretty much have to register for life unless they can come up with a reason to be taken off the registry, which, you know, so they're, they're, they're out there and you can look them up. Treatment. So this is, this is, uh, this is good for you guys to know about this. Some of you may do this. Treatment. So there is a sex offender, like, prison out in the middle of the valley, you know, up there somewhere. Where is it? Colinga. Colinga. That sounds about right. They do a lot of um, sex offenders. Yeah. There, or there might be a, is it Colinga is another one. There's sure. But there's a whole prison just for sex offenders. Why do they have to segregate these guys? Well, they are creepy, yes. They but, can be that. But the other prisoners are creepy, too. Why? Well, yeah, because the other prisoners will... Whatever there is a code of honor among thieves um, and, and criminals, um, you know, for whatever reason, you know, the, the other criminals do not like the sex offenders. They put them in the general population. Um, the other prisoners will, will, how shall we say, in quotes, take care of them. And so they have to, they generally have to be segregated. If, um, and so they, they have, a, again, if you want to get a job working as a psychologist doing your postdoc hours and getting paid for it, this uh, sex offender uh, prison usually has some openings, you know, so you can go there and work. It's out in the middle of nowhere. Um, so, how do you treat these guys? What do you guys think? What's the treatment? What's, what, what, what has been one of the? What's, well, let me put it this way: What is the modality of, 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 of treatment that's been used with these guys? Mostly behaviors. I don't know, maybe, I'm sure now because they do CBT for everything, I'm sure they do CBT, but what is in, in the past, the, the typical treatment is behavioral, and of course they've tried the standard positive behavioral things, reinforcing, you know, um, appropriate age sexual contact. They've also done aversive conditioning. Uh, I had a friend of mine who was a psychologist who, who uh, was involved with this, and this involves a device called the penile plasmograph. We're going to talk a lot about penises. So we might as well just get into it with this. The penile plasmograph, which is a device that attaches to the penis and measures when the penis starts to become erect. It measures, and then what happens is um, the person is then given aversive conditioning. Usually, you know, a Dr. Vinkman-esque <laughs> form of a shock. You guys know about Dr. Vinkman, right, because you've watched Ghostbusters, right? So, um, you know, they, what they used to do in the old days, they'd actually bring one of these guys in, and they would show, you know, they police have captured all this child porn or whatever, and they would show this guy pictures of all these child porn stuff, and he starts to get aroused, and like, you know, and they zap him, and the idea is the aversive conditioning would take hold, and when he saw pictures of children in, you know, whatever thing, instead of getting aroused, he would, he would associate it with, you know, electric shock and no longer get aroused anymore, and then eventually then, of course, stop desiring children. So how do you think that worked out? Yeah, much like the rest of behaviorism, you know, which completely ignores the fact that there's a brain and the brain is wired in a certain way, and you know, and and, and no, it maybe maybe it you know causes the guy to think for a second. Now, my friend swore to God that that it it worked. He thought it it had some level of being able to work, but I don't buy it. And of course, it worked at the time, but then was that that. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not like the recidivism rates. Of, yeah, it's not like the recidivism rates, you know, went down because people were doing this kind of treatment. So, I mean, I think if you have, you know, maybe milder sort of sex offenses, like you got your uh, your peeping tom sort of guy, or you're a flasher, you know, maybe maybe some kind of behaviorism works. They've also tried other things. They had another study where what they did is they decided to do kind of like. You guys know behaviors and stuff more than me. It's, it's kind of like a flooding thing, where they would just what they wanted to do is desensitize these guys to child porn. So what they did is they did exactly the opposite. They showed them tons of child porn, 
right? Just more and more and more, so they're just seeing it all the time, they get desensitized to it, right? It, and this has got to be the, I mean, this, this has got to be one of the stupidest things I've ever heard, but there's a paper on it, you can go look it up. I mean, this has got to be one of the stupidest things I've ever heard, but apparently this is something that was tried. Um, you know, somebody came up with some theory, typical sort of behavioral thing. Um, I don't know, maybe that was a cognitive thing. Yeah, um, yeah not, not, not too, you know, not too helpful. Um, so, yeah, so lots of stuff out there therapy-wise. You know, of course, talk therapy's been done and trying to give these guys some insight into what they're doing. And the, probably where therapy is going to work best is not in the sense that you're going to alleviate these guys' attraction to children because probably to some degree that's very deeply wired in. But what you may be able to do is to, you know, help these guys not to act out on their urges, right? Help them not to act out on this. And, you know, maybe therapy helps with that, maybe it doesn't. You guys can look the research up on that, you know. Again, I, I think the recidivism rates for this sort of in a way speak for themselves. Um, the other type of therapy that's been tried is castration. That sounds, you know, rather harsh, but typically, at least in this country, it's chemical castration. It didn't sound harsh to me, but, um, you know, chemical castration. So they give something, a, a drug that binds the testosterone in the body, reduces the testosterone levels. And this has been shown to be helpful, again, for, you know, helping these guys not to act out on urges. The problem is with chemical castration is that um, it doesn't do anything to the desire. The desire is still there. And the other problem with it is is that, um, you know, the person has to be compliant with getting the, the drug. And I believe typically it's given as an injection like once a month. They go in for an injection once a month. And so if they don't, do, you know, and of course in many cases it's court mandated, but if they don't... If they do, if they take... Um, they can take another hormone. They can take exogenous yeah. testosterone yeah. and so counter it, yeah. So they can be compliant. Yeah, and so there's some problems with this. Um, there are places where, of course, the other type of castration <laughs> is done. And do you think that gets rid of, um, and we're going to talk about castration later on in the semester, so we'll go into some detail about that. Do you think that gets rid of the pedophilia? No. No. Yeah, they can still go left. So again, there's no um, there's no real there's no real good treatment for these guys. I, I actually personally, and we're going to talk about um, lobotomy later in the semester. And I, I, I I've actually in my own mind um, contemplated. I wonder if there's a type of not lobotomy, but a type of maybe a type of surgery that could could intervene in these guys' cases. Of course, it's not it's not politically correct to talk about such things like that. Um, and you'll see why after I give you the lecture on lobotomy. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's a regular lobotomy would not necessarily be a good thing because sometimes the sexual inhibitions are removed. Um, but, you know, people can target parts of the brain now. So, you know, I mean, it's something that no one will actually talk about doing. But were I running the world, I might think about some research on, the, on this. You know, I don't know. I shouldn't even say this in recorded probably. Yeah. Oh yeah, many places. Yeah, have death films before. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So that's about pedophiles. Um, one of the other things to talk about is gangs, and maybe I'll just go through this really quickly. You guys know generally what a gang is. It's three or more persons who have some kind of typical um, identifying thing that, you know, symbolizes their group cohesion. They act in, uh, individually, collectively. Um, they, under the auspices of being in a gang, they engage in criminal activity. It's a pretty broad definition. And there are lots of different kinds of gangs. We're going to talk about um, just a couple. Um, gangs, you know, for people, kids, typically join gangs and, you know, there's been some research done on gangs and, and, and what kids who join gangs get from being gang membership fundamentally, psychologically, is sort of, you know, family membership. And, and this is something, you know, you know, it's been speculated they're not getting this 
at home and they you know they have a need for this and they get this to the gang, they get this sort of family affiliation. And so this is really it, this can be very strong, right? The gang really can become come before other things in the person's life because it's providing that really strong familiar um you know, presence, identity, etc., and that can be a very strong thing, especially for an adolescent. There's a lot of gang members in the United States. Um, again, this is broadly defined. So, you know, some, you know, like I just, you guys have heard of uh, the rap group, the Insane Clown Posse. You heard about them? They're, they're one of my favorite. I think their videos are so outrageous, but they, but they're also, they can also be very satirical. You know, and so. There are these two guys, and they they dress up like, you know, insane clowns, and they do these crazy videos. Some of them are really super like horror movies, you know. Um, but some of them, the songs are funny, and they have like these followers, you know, they're they're fans. They're called the Juggalos, right? <laughs> and recently, the FBI came out, and the FBI came out, and and with an identification as the, of Juggalos as gang members. So they're now on the FBI list of gang members or terrorists or something, which, you know, and, and this is because somebody was wearing an insane clown posse t-shirt and mugged somebody in Washington, D.C. or something. Oh, my God, the Juggalos are a gang. We're going to, you know, and so now, and so the FBI put them on the gang list. And some, you know, God bless them, some enterprising, um, you know, public, uh, you know, minded law firm decided this would be a great pro bono case to get them lots of publicity. So these, this law firm in Detroit, where the insane clown posse is from, um, took the case on, you know, with the ACLU and filed suit against the FBI, saying you can't label these guys as gang members. And so it's actually going through the through the court system now. You know, it's like, you know, like really, you're going to label these guys as gang members? Don't you have something better to do? Um, so when I when I get these kind of statistics from law enforcement people. I tend to take it a little bit with a grain of salt. I think that they, you know, again, this is coming from Deb, who I love and respect, uh, but I think some of this may be exaggerated. I mean, you know, if, you, if this number came from the FBI, this is including, you know, a few thousand juggalos in there, you know, I, I'm, personally, I'm not really thinking the juggalos, to me, my personal definition of the gang is they don't, they don't, they don't fit in that. Okay. So... You know, and, and of course, you know, back in the '60s, you know, when all the wood hippies went to Woodstock, you know, oh my God, they're all subversive. You know, we better keep an eye on them. You know, yeah, really, they don't think they're a gang. You know, so I take this with a little bit of grain of salt. But there are lots of gang members. Supposedly, 300,000 gang members and 2,000 gangs in California. We have quite a few here. Um, reasons for joining a gang. And we talked about this: identity, recognition, family. You know. Uh, affiliation protection. You know, you're living in a place where there's lots of gangs, you know, who are beating you up or attacking you, so you join a gang and, you know, then you've got people to back you up. Uh, brotherhood, again, that goes with that familial feeling. Intimidation, somebody just may be intimidated to join a gang, you better join a gang or else. Criteria, again, this is the criteria that's used in Oxnard supposedly for, um, you know, identifying people under the gang injunction. You guys know about the gang injunction, right, which is very controversial. No. You know, there's a lot of uh, civic leaders in the Latino community who feel like this is like just basically profiling Latinos, Latinas, and it's unfair. Um, law enforcement will come back and say, crime has gone down in Oxnard. You know, gang activity has gone down quite a bit. You know, violent crime has gone down. This thing seems to be working. It's worked in other communities. You know, we're not profiling, and what we're not profiling because this is what we have to use. Here are the criteria that we have to use to determine gang membership. Okay, it's not having anything to do with the person's race or, you know, what they look like. So, I mean, it is what they look like, but they have to look like gang members. They don't have to look like Latinos, right? You can take that how you may. You know, I, I have friends on both sides of the issue, um, and I can see both points. You know, I, I think. Okay, uh, Ventura County gangs, we have a number here. Um, my friend's a cop in Santa Paula, so, you know, he's talking he's, he's, he's about the gangs in Santa Paula. Um, Oxnard, the Colonia Chiques are the, you know, they've been the one that's been identified as a problem, and I guess they're down at five points, and they're the ones who are the subject of the gang injunction. And you got lots of others. We have them in uh, Thousand Oaks. We got them in Camarillo. 
Um, so if you think you know it's just a West County thing, no. Um, and actually the worst gang, the most violent gang, is in Newbury Park in South Oaks. Small, but they're very violent. Yeah. And this isn't all of them, there's more than just these. Okay, Colonial Chicas, you know, guys we know about them. Here's some pictures of them. They like to post this stuff on, on Facebook. They have big internet presence. I have this client that I'm working with right now. Um, and they assigned him to me because I'm, where I was at last year, I worked with a lot of like LA County gang members, and those are like real hardcore gang members. Uh, so they assigned this guy to me because he's more like hardcore. Yeah. And I um, he walked into the room, he's got his tent shades, and he's got East Side, La Colonia, Cashews, like, like a goatee. Yeah. In addition to East Side, and lots of this, I don't know, and lots of and all his head. Like, oh, are you a gang member? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, don't over underestimate the uh, don't underestimate the power of identification. You know, it's really important to people. I could go off on a tangent and talk to you about tattoos in general. You know, having a having this, but I won't. Um, that's for another another class. <laughs> Actually, we will talk about that a little bit later. We're going to talk about that a little later. I think we'll get to that. So anyway, you can read. This is the stuff they post on the on the internet here. You know. And, Got the whole thing going on. Um, now, of course, you know, it's, it's easy to pick on Latinos in this county, you know, as gang members, but the original gangsters in Ventura County are uh, uh, outlaw motorcycle gangs. You know, I had a friend of mine who grew up in Ventura in the 70s, and basically the entire city of Ventura was, you know, run by um, one specific outlaw motorcycle gang. Anybody guess which one that is? Hell's Angels. A very strong presence in Ventura County. And they still have a strong presence here. And uh, um, there, here's the three that you will see the most often, Hell's Angels. And their, or their arch enemies are the Mongols. And I don't know about the Bacos, where they are, but the Hell's Angels and the Mongols, you know, they, they, you know they, they kill each other. And the way, you know, um, the outlaw motorcycle gangs now, you know, in a way, they are the other end from like the street gangs. You know, they're almost like the mafia. They're almost like they almost operate like organized criminal syndicates now. You know, um, you know where they, you know, they, they send their kids to law school. You know, the guy at the head of the Hell's Angels down here, Christy, you know, his daughter went to law school, and if one of them gets arrested, you know, she's there, you know, at the courthouse. You know, I mean, and this is this is what you know the mafia and the East Coast the same. They have lawyers. You know, I mean, they're very sophisticated about things. You know, and then they try to tell you, oh, we do toy runs for kids. We're doing all this charitable activity, but really they make their money. You know, you know through through selling drugs. And you know, Hell's Angels been associated with meth for a while. Um, you know, before even the current meth craze. You know, they were known for for that. And then it's probably how they make their money. Are they Mongols Chinese? Are they no, 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 no. They're not Mongols. They're not like the original Mongols, right? Because if you lived in China back in the era of warring states and the Mongols were coming in, you might have considered them to be like a biker gang. So, you know, Mongols is a pretty good name for a biker gang, actually, if you think about it historically. Um, of course, the Mongols would have a different viewpoint of that. You know, we're just living our nomadic, but they live nomadic lives. They like to ride out, they get out in the wind and ride their horses and... Um, you know, they were brilliant warriors. I have a colleague, Dr. Corbett, um, who is an expert on the Mongols. And so every year he lectures for my class. It's a beautiful lecture about uh, the Mongols, you know. And they were a very, very interesting um, group of people. They had the largest empire in the history of, of, of the planet, you know. I mean, went all the way from China all the way up into Eastern Europe, up into Russia. <coughs> and, and had profound effects on... On, on civilization. So, this Mongol, no. <laughs> not, not so much. Okay. Um, gang memberships, Hell's Angels, uh, you're 21 years old, you gotta own the Harley, you have these sponsored fight remember, and you become a prospect. So, just for your gang identification knowledge, when you see these guys wearing these jackets here, they don't have the patch on the back, mm -hmm. these guys are prospects. And this is the full member here, he's got the full patch. So, these guys are essentially this guy's bitch. Right, if you want to put it in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Now you are always watching. So there you go. Um, structure club again. It's very much like more organized crime, like than anything. Um, 
Uh, things you may have heard about, um, again, you know, these guys wanted to wear their colors, you know, when they get to county fair, and they, they were forced to take them off, and of course they filed lawsuits, and you know, again, they're very sophisticated. Again, this is the dress code thing. When I was a kid um, in the 70s, um, there was a, there was, I lived in the Bay Area, and there was a Hell's Angel crash house, where they just, they, they rented a house, and they would all just crash there. And it was in my neighborhood, and we would ride our bikes by. One day I was riding by, and I got a flat tire, and the guy's like, well, uh, bring your bike over here, kid. And, and he fixed my tire, you know, he fixed my bike tire for me, and we'd go by there if our bikes broke down. And, they would, you know, and, they, and there was a whole period where up in the Bay Area, you know, there was, it was kind of during the time, Ken Kesey and the electric Kool-Aid acid test. And for a while, a lot of them were taking a lot of LSD, and they mellowed out. And it became very mellow for a while, <laughs> you know. So it, it, there's a whole tie-in, you know, to the history of the '60s and '70s, and the the history of the counterculture, you know, and, and the hate Ashbury movement and drug use, you know, um, and the South Hell's Angels. Very interesting. Jerry Garcia was interviewed about the Hell's Angels because they used to do security for the Grateful Dead shows, you know, and they would hire them, or they were sort of, I don't know, intimidated or said, "Hey, you better hire them," you know. Um, and Jerry Garcia was quoted, they asked about the Hells Angels, and he goes, he says, they're very good in violent spaces. <laughs> you know, which I thought was just a perfect apt quote for the great, for, you know, Guy and Grateful Dead to talk about the Hells Angels. Take that as you will. Now, um, Deb likes to talk about this. Um, if you see these guys and they've got these wings on their, on their vest, these, these indicate certain acts, uh, certain uh, sexual acts that have to be witnessed by um, another person or a group of people. And so I'll give these to you, not to gross you out before lunch, um, but I'll give these to you just, you know, for the hell of them, if I can remember all of them. Um, blue wings is basically, you get these if you have oral sex with a female police officer. And this has to be done in front of other people. Okay. Um, consenting or not consenting? It doesn't matter, but I would assume it's consenting. Yeah, you know. wow. um, brown wings, I think you can guess what this is. Um, yeah. This would have to do with anal sex. Uh, red wings, um, having oral sex with a woman while she is uh, menstruating. Sorry, it's going to get grosser. Um, oh, I can't remember which one. Oh, uh, purple wings. Having sex with a corpse, female corpse. Necrophilia. Necrophilia, yeah. That's purple. It has to be witnessed by the people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah purple. <laughs> Green wings, having um, uh, oral sex with a woman who has a sexually transmitted disease. Oh, okay. yeah. And gold wings is having sex with, uh, I think it's with, with a woman in front of 15 or more people. Something like that. So, you see these guys at the county fair, they're wearing their wings now, even though, you know. Yeah. Here you go, here's some, uh, <coughs> these are, this guy's a Mongol, because look at his tattoo here. Right. And this guy here. Yeah. Now, um, the most violent gang out there are the uh, Mara Salvatrucha. This is a gang um, that uh, it's comprised originally of, of people who came from El Salvador and they came here to America and they tried to join other gangs and the other gangs wouldn't have them so they decided screw it we'll form our own gang and they formed their own gang and their gang has you know ex -El, El Salvadorian death squad members and people who have training in the military and they are really very brutal as for the other gangs you know you got to sort of provoke them a little bit you know for them to do violence these guys will just you know they don't need any reason to to shoot you or knife you or something. They're very, very dangerous. Supposedly they are have a presence in Newberry Park of all places, which I think of as like, you know, it's like the safest place you could imagine in the county, but apparently they have a presence there. Um, yeah, and these guys will typically have like facial tattoos, MS-13. Um, if you see these guys, they're there to be, they're, they're probably to be avoided. Yeah. <laughs> They'll have tattoos in the face. I have a picture here. They'll have tattoos on the face, and, and the, the, you know, this guy here, 
Uh, MS-13, you know, typically, and they are, they're, they're very, yeah. very, very brutal. So these are guys to really watch out for. Oh. <laughs> um, again, so, so they came from their death squad. All right. 20,000, Deb says now this is probably 40,000. Large, very large criminal gang. They have a presence in many, many cities. Okay, they use the gangs use the the internet. So there you go. I love this computer. It's very ancient. Okay. And you can get beat into the gang. If there's some gangs require you to commit a violent crime, some gangs to become a memory of go out and randomly kill somebody. You hear about these every now and then. All right. So um, talk a little bit about homicides. I don't want to spend too much time on this. Um, types, uh, murder, attempted murder, second degree murder, voluntary manslaughter. Okay. Um, what's the difference between first degree and second degree murder? That's the important one for you to know about. Premeditation. Pre yeah. First degree murder, you got to plan. To it. Second degree murder, you walk in and your husband is screwing some other woman you know, in the middle of bed and you, know, you happen to be a you know, a uh, you know, Second Amendment rights, you know, fanatic, and you have a concealed carry permit, you pull out your handgun and blast them both. That's that, you know, crime of passion. You didn't plan to do it, but you just came in and you got pissed off seeing them cheating and you shot them, right? And so you get a different kind of sentence for second degrees. First degree is like, you know, I know my husband's cheating on me. I, I you know, I, I, I know that they're doing it, so I'm going to make this plan that I'm going to pay somebody to assassinate him or I'm going to go and make this elaborate plan so I don't get caught. That's first degree murder. Okay. Surprising when finding out, oh my God, crime of passion, you know, second degree. Um, again, we talked about this. Most homicides are committed by men. I have heard that the statistic is that, that um, the number of violent crimes by women is increasing. Um, I, I don't know the specifics about that. Uh, currently, the most dangerous city supposedly is New Orleans, but I heard it's changed now. I'm trying to remember which one it, it, it went to. Could, I don't know. If there's a, uh, I'll have to remember that. Somebody can look that up. Um, Average age of murder victims 31. Average age of murder is 27. Commonly cited reason for murder is uh, money arguments. Uh, Columbia has the highest murder rates. Um, U.S. is 24. Columbia, you know, narco traficantes, you know, and it makes sense. Um, fewest number of murders occur in Qatar, and I was wondering if state-approved murders were included in that, but I, I don't know how to ask that question. I'm already getting in trouble with all the Muslim, my, my Muslim brothers. So I don't think I'll ask the question. Taxi cab driver, the number one most dangerous mm -hmm. job that most likely to get you murdered. Yeah. Okay. Taxi cab drivers is, uh, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's a dangerous occupation. Mm -hmm. So don't become a taxi cab driver. And then um, police officer, obviously, you'd expect. <laughs> Motives for killing, profit, passion, hatred, power, revenge, opportunity, mm -hmm. fear, contract killing, desperation, Compassion, you know, for your Kevorkians out there. Uh, rituals. Mass murder. We're going to talk more about these guys later on mass murder, especially the school shooters. So I won't go into this very much. We're also going to talk about um, uh, suicide by cop a little bit. And we'll, so we'll get into this a little bit later. Serial killers. Uh, most are white, heterosexual males. Um, they range in age from 25 to 34. Uh, they tend to be sexually dysfunctional, and um, they be very self-involved and you know very narcissistic. Which, of course, is like ketchup; it goes with everything. And they some may enjoy cannibalism and necrophilia. Okay, and these are guys typically that you know at a young age, you know people look around and go, "Yeah, there's something wrong with that guy." In fact, you know Dahmer, when people knew him in high school, he was people thought of him as the most likely guy to become a serial killer. People, other high school students would say that about him. You know, so, you know, you have that kind of odd guy. And again, this is the one where if they're torturing cats, um, you know, they're bedwetting, there's a whole bunch of things in here, um, then you go, oh, something wrong with that kid. We better watch him, right? 
Characteristics, sometimes they keep something in the victim, a body part or jewelry, kill three or more people on separate occasions. Difficult to apprehend. Serial killers typically will plan out what they're doing. They don't want to get caught. They'll plan things out. The mass murderers, you know, the school shooters, they want to make a big splash. You know, they're sort of expecting to be killed. They want to be kind of become infamous. They want lots of publicity, who they are. Serial killers hide. They don't want people to know who they are. And so they're very difficult, difficult to apprehend. And they, they're, they're mentally disturbed, but they're not delusionally psychotic, right? So again, this also makes them difficult to apprehend. A lot of times they're illegitimate kids, and many, if not all, are to some degree abused as children. Emotional, physical, sexual abuse as children. Right? And most are men, but there are some uh, females. 76% of the world's serial killers reside in the United States. Um, this comes from the FBI, I believe. They, they compile statistics around where they find them. 90% uh, are male. FBI estimates there's 500 serial killers out there right now in the United States who haven't been caught. Um, they enjoy torturing animals. Ladies. They like to set fires. So he gives a kid in the neighborhood who likes to set fires and he likes to torture animals. Uh, perhaps he's a very serious bedwetter, you know, up into his preteen years. That's a kid probably somebody ought to keep an eye on. And it, that, 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 there's, there's a real, those are real risk factors. There. You're in your practice and you get a kid referred to you and he's got these characteristics. Those are some real risk factors. Um, they usually like to stab or strangle their victims. They take a lot of enjoyment, sadistic enjoyment out of over the killings so they don't want it over too quickly. Um, serial killer, unlike um, you know, the, the, the you know, murderers, um, there's little or previous con little or no previous connection to the victim. So a lot of these, they, they pick somebody out, you know, for whatever specific reason they have. It has nothing to do with who the victim is and knowing the person. You know, maybe the guy, you know, was abused by his blonde mommy, and so he just goes out and he's picking, mo you know, blonde moms, you know, and just randomly, you know, it's this kind of opportunity. There's a blonde mom, and he's got a good chance to go in and, you know, get her without getting caught, and he'll just go for it. Um, a lot of serial killers have family history of alcohol and drug abuse. It's certainly the case in Jeffrey Dahmer. His parents are pretty alcoholic. Uh, almost all of them subject to emotional abuse in addition to other stuff, and they develop into very sexually dysfunctional adults. They can't sustain a mature, consensual sexual relationship. And so, you know, again, that thought to fuel the frustration that leads them to learn to, you know, get enjoyment from the killing. Prostitutes, drifters, hitchhikers, generally victims of choice. Why do you think that might be? Say it louder. Yeah. yeah. These are these are people who if they get killed, you know, they're on their own. They're you know. Um, so again, you know, I don't suggest any of these things as occupations. Um, we talked about hitchhikers already. Um, Four types, subtypes of serial killer, the visionary type, the mission-oriented type, the hedonistic type, power-oriented type. Um, the visionary is the guy who has some kind of, I'm trying to remember these, he has some kind of, um, you know, fantasy or vision about something, you know, how he wants something to go. The mission-oriented type, I believe, you know, is the person who lays out the plan, likes to have the plan, go, things going according to the plan. The hedonistic type is just, you know, just, it's just pure pleasure. You know, the killing is really pleasurable. And the power in the type likes having the power over somebody. First person ever labeled a serial killer is this guy, H.H. H. Holmes. He was a doctor. You know, so you know, doctor serial killer is going to be bad news. Uh, Ted Bundy, serial killers from all, all walks of life. They can be, you know, um, Really, anybody. Ted Bundy was, you know, good-looking, well-spoken guy. His uh, modus operandi was he would put a fake cast on his arm and be out in the parking lot trying to put his groceries in the car, and you know, uh, feel like he was hurt or dropped or stuff. And women would come up to him and go, "Oh, let me help you," and that's how he, he would get him into the car and drive him off the hill. Except he was a pre-law student, um, or maybe he was a law student. I can't remember, but he represented himself in the trial, which of course. Want to do. And I believe he was executed. I think Ted Bundy was executed. 
Oh, yeah, have some women. Uh, Eileen Wernos, as you guys, they made a movie about her. Um, yeah. She was a prostitute, hated men, and um, would, you know, lure them back and then kill them. Jeffrey Dahmer, um, sort of the poster boy for serial killers, uh, liked to uh, bring young men back to his place, uh, drug them, kill them, um, uh, have sex with them, and then uh, chop them up and eat them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he tried to make them zombies. Tried to do homemade lobotomies with a drill and make them into zombies. Um, uh, one one guy, um, and he was caught because a guy, you know, he brought to the house escaped and alerted the, I believe, and alerted. No, and the guy got caught, but he was a 15 year old boy. Yeah. Police found him, and then Jeffrey Dahmer said, "Oh no, he's just a friend of mine. We can't. They let him go." And so he went back with him. Back with him. Yeah, but got back with him. Like they, there was an interaction. Yeah, but that was before Dahmer was trying to kill you know, it was just the kind of molestation part of it. No, it was the kid Or was he drugged? I can't remember. Drugged. Yeah, he was drugged. That's what but anyway, he got out and yeah. that's what unraveled this and of course they found all these body parts in his house and everything. And Dahmer was sentenced to prison and um and, and of course, you know, what happens sometimes in the prison if the guards or whatever decide they don't like you, um, then they just accidentally sort of on purpose allow you to be in with the other prisoners and that's probably what happened to Dahmer he was killed by the other prisoners. Um, another guy, I don't know much about the specifics about him. Um, but again you see um, African American men very rare. You know, not typical. Uh, there's another one. Another, uh, again another African American very rare. Right, so you know, we're trying to show the diversity of serial killers here, but the truth of the matter is, you know, in most cases these are not uh, other anybody other than white males. What was it, Chris Rock? You know, the comedian. He has this whole like it, it, it's hilariously funny. This whole rap about like you know he's on the elevator, you know he's riding the elevator, and like a bunch of white males get in, he just get like really scared, you know, like it's like yeah, there's a good reason for that, you know. Um, and these, are, these, were, these two were in the news recently. You guys may have heard about this. This is the 19-year-old girl and her husband. And supposedly they would go on Craigslist and say, you know, lure people back for sexual favors. And then, and then he would come up behind them and strangle them. And then they would, uh, you know, and apparently when they caught them, she, uh, she said that they've been doing this for a long time. And they get some enjoyment out of it. So. Have you seen the movie Hard Candy? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, when I... As a story, I was like, it's just like the movie, Hard Candy. Yeah. But I think that there's a lot of things that are evidence that it actually did. Yeah, I mean, in one case, I, I know there's one, but yeah, they don't, and who knows, you know, maybe she's bragging. We don't know. So we'll find out. We'll keep following this one. Um, Deadly serial killer all the time. I'm trying to remember this guy's name. You can look it up on, uh, on, um, on uh, Wikipedia, but I think he's been surpassed. I think there's another guy. He's South American. Um, Supposedly 300 plus uh, victims, and he uh, he is at large. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so somewhere he's out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no Megan's Law website for him. Two most famous serial killers have never been caught. Oh, good one. A plus for you, yeah. When I was a kid, the Zodiac Killer was in San Francisco area, so that's how we would we'd be out at night. Man, you better not go out at night. The Zodiac will get you. Scared, you know. All right, and I'll leave you with this because these are these are dev stories, which I'm not going to tell you. Crystal Hamilton's another. Uh, this is a case in Ventura County of a, of a 19-year-old girl whose body was found in the water, floating out in the bay, and they didn't. Um, no, it was wrong with her, so she was nude, and they did DNA evidence, and they found DNA from the sperm inside her, and um, uh, they figured she'd been raped and killed, but, and they put the DNA through the national database, and they got a hit on a guy in the county who had no connection to her whatsoever. And um, this is a case that Deb actually um, investigated, 
And, uh, and you can't just prosecute somebody because you have a DNA match. That's not enough. You'd think it might be enough, but it wouldn't. And um, the guy had no connection to her, and, um, and Deb actually was able to very, very uh, cleverly bring him in for questioning and, um, and tripped him up and, and started talking to him about, you know, can you help me with this case? And you know, I've got this girl I'm investigating, you know, been raped and blah, blah, blah. And the guy tripped up and, and said to her, oh, well, you know, she, at the end, you, you know, she said, yeah, you know, this is a really, really difficult case. You know, yeah, you know, it's just, it's just been really tough. And, like, and the guy said, oh, guy, I, I know it must be tough, you know, because, you know, it must be really hard because she was, you know, because you know, she was killed. And Deb had never mentioned that she, she had killed. been killed. Right, so he... You know, tripped himself up, and eventually was prosecuted, and is now on death row. Mm-hmm. And, and it was very interesting. And he was an opportunity. He'd been he'd been convicted of rape before, but he got out of prison. He was married to a very lovely woman, lived up in Ojai, and it was just a it was a crime of opportunity. Crystal was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and he drove by, and you know, just very random.